Okay, so that's it. 401, we will honor you all by starting very promptly. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion on how do global oligopolies matter for business strategy and the international political economy. My name is Susan Murray and I'm director of the David Hume Institute, a think tank based in Edinburgh. For the eagle-eyed among you, you will recall that this event was originally planned in partnership with the University of Edinburgh way back before the start of lockdown and then unfortunately we had to postpone it. So I am absolutely delighted that we're here today um, and it feels like it's a Christmas present to all of you. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome Professor of Corporate Strategy Chris Carr from the University of Edinburgh Business School in conversation with Geoffrey Fear, Professor of International Business History at the University of Glasgow. Now today, before I hand over to Geoffrey, a couple of bits of housekeeping. We're recording the discussion and we'll make it available later on the David Hume Institute website. It will be open for questions after about 30 minutes, the initial part of the conversation. So please use the chat function if there's anything you think you might not remember for 30 minutes. Um, do put them there, Geoffrey will get to them or feel free to contribute as we go. Um, so now without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Geoffrey and please enjoy the discussion. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I usually don't make it to Edinburgh, as you can tell. I still haven't made it to Edinburgh, um, but I won't spend very much time uh, introducing myself at all and uh, start with uh, immediate questions for uh, Chris. Um, and we thought we'd start out with a kind of a big question, and that is, why did you choose this title for your book, which is Global Oligopoly, um, which is a key idea for business and society. So I wanna come back to that society part at the end here, because it's clearly meant as a reality of the global economy, but also as a kind of concept, as an idea. And so if I think of it this way, I mean, when I say oligopoly, I immediately think of John Kenneth Galbraith and kind of complacent, tacit polluters, kind of big three automakers in the late 1960s or so. That's clearly not the representation of these firms in this book. Um, so Chris, could you start us up by explaining the title as well as why this concept is so important. Right. Okay. Well, thank, first of all, I just thank you. Thank uh, the David Hume Institute, uh, Susan Murray, and yourself, Jeffrey, coming from Glasgow University as a professor of international business history. Um, I'm very privileged to have you all uh, here. And uh, first, Jeff, if, if you can kind of bear with me just for a little bit, I've got to go back 250 years or ago, really, when Adam Smith here in Edinburgh really argued that nations really had to embrace market capitalism as opposed to feudalism, cronyism, protectionism, and monopolies, which were the characteristic of the world then and to some extent still true today. But he argued that this could create unprecedented wealth, taking us right out of the dark ages of those Malthusian poverty traps. And this was really the first time it happened. And notwithstanding all the economist Jeremiah's of the day, Britain really did move to the global number one in terms of GDP per head by the time of the Battle of Waterloo. And America followed in our footsteps with the same Wealth of Nations book and the same notions of capitalism and on an even greater scale and delivered so much wealth of the wealthiest economy in the world right up certainly to the 70s, 1970s. So very powerful idea. But there was always a problem, a lacunae in Adam Smith's theory. As Marx argued, if scale economies, which we all agree in your pin industry, Mr. Smith, are so enormous, why should we not see a concentration all the way to global oligop global monopolies? And if that happens, you don't get vigorous capitalism. You get sclerosis. You get massive appropriation, potentially instability 
and grinding poverty for many. So what then happened was that for decades, half the world chose Marxian state planning and the two contrasting systems stood on the brink of nuclear Armageddon. Chinese, and yeah, in terms of ideas mattering, we could have eliminated the world with those two different perspectives. Now, since then, Chinese and other Marxian economies have indeed taken up and embraced global markets. And they have created untold wealth. And indeed, reducing world poverty as never before. And Smith's division of labor really has been going global. Now, the problem remains for Adam Smith and for classical economists which is that markets turn out to be only very rarely as fragmented as Smith imagined. Even the pin industry by 1980 was controlled by four major global players from different countries. So, and it turns out that recognizing this power of potential oligopolists of the top players in the world, is absolutely crucial to uh, uh, understanding wealth in the 21st century. So the, what my book then tries, tries to uh, understand and tell people about is how we can chart this phenomena of concentration and its impacts in all sectors as markets become more and more concentrated globally. The word oligos just means few. So it means typically four players may control say 40%, but of the entire global market. And then what happens is a quite enormous degree of concentration of wealth creation in the hands of these few top global oligopolists. National oligopolists used in contrast to be quite cozy, collusive arrangements like Galbraith uh, put it, but actually these new oligopolies are quite the opposite. As Groves used to argue at Intel, only the paranoid survive. It has become so fast moving, so dynamic, that these pretty players are putting in massive investments and they are really fighting from different positions, their corners very hard indeed. So coming back to the present, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google's combined market capitalizations have more than trebled in just five years. And they are roughly twice the size of the entire UK FTSE, or indeed the UK's entire GDP. Walmart and Amazon today employ 3.5 million that compares with 1.3 million for our biggest employer, the National Health Service. So should we ignore these global oligopolists? You simply cannot understand economic wealth creation any longer in the world today. My book uses big data, not just to analyze four, but to analyze all 30,000 big, large companies. And armed with a comprehensive sector map, we then have precise ways of analyzing their outcomes and the impact on the world. So my message is that companies and nations are going to have to really embrace not only Adam Smith's open markets, but they're gonna to have to embrace working together with the world's top 
oligopolists, their FDIs, their investments are going to prove vital to the wealth of the nation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, let me kind of follow up on a couple of the so, so, as, as I read the, your book, uh, there's a lot of companies, these global oligopolies that you actually really admire. And if I go back to what you said about Adam Smith, I'm not sure Adam Smith would admire these firms so much, Adele. But you have these a couple of firms that kind of jump out in the text over and over again as kind of model oligopolies uh, or companies for that matter. Uh, GKN, Inditex or Zara is more popularly known, Hire, uh, also Semex or so. So what are the qualities about these companies about and a companies and about their strategies that make them so effective in the global marketplace? Okay. Or, or well, take, take effective in the global marketplace. <laughs> Take Inditex, Sig Zara. You know, it's not that many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, that Inditex was the disruptor. Fast fashion was totally new and unknown. It was just an engineer, someone like myself originally, um, Ortega, who took this business model and he incubated it for decades. He got it better and better. And having got it really unique and so well-tuned. The old adage is that invent a better mousetrap and the world comes to you. In the case of Zara and most global companies, that's not true. But if you invent a better mousetrap in terms of a really good business model and you really get it good and you implement it well, you can take that business model to the world. We put the assets in around the world, and that has been an incredible story of wealth creation uh, in the last 30 years, mainly organically with our cooperation, unlike other companies that we have to use M&As as well. But that's one good example, I think. Um, I think a GKN, uh, GK's whole history since the same time of same year of Adam Smith, 1759, going right the way back, has been a, a story of internationalization, of entrepreneurs taking businesses and taking them international uh, from the earliest days. And, you know, I've, I guess I, I was on the, the small four man team that built the US factories for them. And you know, none of us quite knew what the word global strategy was in those days. But I can tell you that our guys who failed to do that, as my colleagues before in forgings, every one of them lost their jobs. And the tr taking drive chains global, it began with our factories going to the USA, but it then went with colleagues into India, Shanghai, then into 30 countries with joint ventures, eventually becoming acquisitions, even then recently into Russia, um, back with Greenfield Sites again, as we did it. That kept the company alive in those desperate times of the 1980s. It was so successful globally. I guess that would be about 40% of the world market. But um, so I really believe there's a contrast that companies that can get the global strategy right can really be effective in the world. A lot of our competitors disappeared. Okay. So, so um, higher, perhaps we, perhaps we should hold it there, but I'd be happy to go into other companies as well. Well, no, I was gonna say, so how do, you, how do you get your global strategy right? Do all companies need to go global? Is that the key? If you don't go global, then you'll just be eaten up by these global oligopolies? Um, no, I, I would certainly, uh, uh, defer from that position, Jeff. I don't want to be a kind of uh, messiah of let's all go global. There are a million writers saying that. Uh, no, the whole point of my book is that we map, in chapter one, we map every single sector. Um, and you need to position your company sector on that map. And to do that, we develop global concentration metrics so we can show the trend. And but I would say the trend 
in most sectors. We've had so many sectors, beer, spirits, uh, in the past that were far less global. We have seen a transformation on average. But of course, if you were in the funeral business, or dare I say it, in the hairdressers business, which I loathe, actually, of course, that is much more national. Therefore, the starting point of strategy is to know your sector. You wouldn't dream of going to sea without a chart, and you shouldn't go into international business or even to face up to international rivals unless you have got a map, a chart, showing you where your sector is, and that's a starting point for strategy. It should also help governments. So can I ask, because one of the things I found really interesting is that you had a uh, the midsection of the book is like this interesting juxtaposition beside, uh, between these kind of mid-size niche companies that work with a also with a global strategy, but they come from Germany, and which is a very wealthy, wealthy country. Yeah. And the next two chapters after that are about these newly emerging market champions, global champions. So they're very different kinds of firms, yet now you have the group of, you say, smaller firms that you would think might not go global at all, yet they are. And then another set of emerging market firms that are, you know, competing a good portion on lower wages or just a lower standard, lower wages and and various other uh, and maybe labor intensive businesses. Um, what kind of what do they have in common? Um, well, there there are differences, of course. If you come from an advanced country like Germany, typically we have very high relative labor costs. And so the classic German successful niche strategy is to be absolute top end. We have to be very strong on technology, on very strong on innovation. And there's no other way we're gonna compete just on, on wages. So typically we need that Zara type business model to be top brand, top technology to have a chance of taking that global successfully. And the wonderful thing about those companies is their focus, their willingness to go early into global markets, their willingness to do it relentlessly with enormous strategic control and determination. So um, that is one model. But if you come from China or you come from India, it is slightly different. Uh, what happens is that those players today have got massive potential relative comparative advantage because of not just because of low labor costs, but because in, in China or even India, you have massive volumes. So typical engineering companies I talked to in China have got massive scale back there. But if say higher in domestic appliances, which is now the, has overtaken the West now as the number one, they emerge from a swamp of incredible inefficient factories in Marxist days. But those execs had vision for the world. Now, what happens has to be to stage if you come from emerging markets. Stage one is just to get your that relative advantage and win at home and you get scale. And with that determination, a reasonably good business model, preferably bringing in, say, German technology from your German technology partner, brings you up to speed. But the problem comes when you go international. When you go international, hire cannot compete just using China's low labor costs when it's got assets on the ground in the USA. What it has to do is it's now paying American wages. It's now lobbying American senators. But what it has to do is come in then with focus. And it then has to have a business model that will deliver on the brand and on technology. It has to have a very, very good business model. And so stage one may be relatively basic where you've got the home advantage of low cost. The real winners are, have got stage two in mind. And when they come into our markets, they're looking for two things. They're looking for markets and brands, yeah. and they are looking for top technology. So many are targeting German companies of the type we're talking about, 
because they regard them as better technology in manufacturing, typically, as compared with, say, the USA. And so they have a vision, but they need a two-stage approach in emerging markets. And those are formidable competitors for us. Yeah. So if we sit back, if we simply say, well, we, we don't have to worry about this. The problem we've got is this. As of a couple of years ago, Honda is joint venturing with partners in Vietnam who are a fraction of Chinese labor costs, who are a fraction of ours. They're not quite yet up to Chinese quality, which is now very high. But with Honda on board, believe you me, multinationals will work with their partners. They will be brought up to speed on world-class technology. And as of tomorrow, a company that is not really pushing it internationally is going to find they're up against emerging market players with low labor costs and some of the best business models in the world behind them. And we've got to be competitive as against that. So can I just go follow up? Because one of the interesting things you're saying is that these firms are basically picking their spots in the world to where they compete. And I think there's a quote from Carlos Ghosn in the book here, that global firms basically have the ability to source globally and then, you know, pick their spots, configure their strategy to emerging markets or uh, very wealthier markets or so. But then the other story that you have is that a lot of the headquarters of these big global oligopolies, as well as the profits and things, there's some figures in there, 40% of the sales and profits essentially get funneled in through the largest firms in the world. And those are located in just a few firms, uh, just a few countries. And I wanna talk about the political power, which has been asked aspect a little in about five minutes or so, but how does the home market, like coming from a particular country, now, does that matter anymore? Uh, where the home um, market is to this strategy or the way these firms think, or it doesn't matter at all anymore. Place doesn't matter. Well, going back five years or so, uh, Ghosn sent shockwaves through the components industry. When he took over Nissan, he said to brought all the suppliers in and he said, as of today, we buy Japanese components. That's the tradition in Japan. As of tomorrow, we buy globally. And he meant it. And it had happened with when I was in Spain talking to Spanish suppliers who'd suddenly had an order from GM that said, by the way, make sure you put in the foreign direct investment for plants in Asia in the pricing of your next component. And by the way, we don't just want one plant in Asia that happens to be around. We want one reasonably close to Thailand. And so suddenly overnight, we woke up to international procurement. And it massively changes your bargaining position. It means the components industry almost on that day knew in Japan it had to be globally orientated. It had to start moving assets around the world. That is a transformation. But when that happens, actually, we do stop thinking quite so much about the home locale. Um, it does still matter. Of course, the Chinese are quite political. The Japanese are very patriotic, too. And so are we. But the fact is, you have to change. Um, you know, uh, my company that I was at, GKN, you know, back in the 70s, was mainly UK orientated. And then we realized that Rover Cars was going down, our top 15 car company customers worldwide were all outside Britain. So we knew we had to change the entire orientation of the balance sheet, all our assets, all our employees, all our technology. It had to be dispersed globally or we would be, we just couldn't have survived, not on the UK home market. No, I understand that about the, in terms of you can't just survive in your own home market, but does it matter for the management and let's say for the flow of funds throughout the world that they're coming into well, concentrated? What, what I'm saying is we then do become very footloose at that point. I mean, the, the head office, I think we used Redditch head office, so three's me close to an airport. That airport 
it's convenient, but there isn't that much difference between the orientation towards investment of big British companies who are successful all the way around the world and say take Unilever or something and and a global player from America. Um, we we know we've got to serve the world. AstraZeneca today is a wonderful company. I'm really impressed. But have a look at the balance sheet. Even if the acquisition of, uh, goes ahead today, we're talking 32% of its sales are coming from China. You know, and uh, so the new acquisition will give them a bigger boost in America, but they're already probably slightly overweight in America. UK is pretty small, relatively speaking. So. It's a great British company, one of the very few we've got that has really done very well under their new chief executive. But you know, it, it's, its assets, its orientation has to be pretty global today. Okay, all right. So let me, let me switch a little bit here to the second part, uh, I guess, of what we're going to is you said a key idea for business and society. So I wanna talk more about the society aspect of mm -hmm. it. And this is basically a question, I have pretty much the same question that Keith McDonald put up on the chat. Um, and I'll just quote him to start off kind of more the, a little bit more of the discussion, but I think that this is him. I think that there can be little doubt that many industries are oligopolies or even monopolies. One problem is that the wealth derived brings enormous political power, particularly in an era of nationalism, which weakens across uh, cross national government action. And so, yeah. The thing that struck me, and they have a number of statistics, it's one of the things on page 304, the top four global oligopoly players averaged around 40% of profits and sales across a lot of different sectors, including R&D, capital expenditure, sales, everything else like that. Uh, if, it, if they're even more concentrated, almost 60%. These are going to roughly the top I don't know, call it the top 10 states in the world where the, those, those funds are being repatriated to. Yeah. Um, uh, and at one point in the thing, you also say that they're eclipsing the national governments. So where does this leave democracy? Are they just, they're just too powerful. Well, let's take the appropriation point, Jeff, because it's very important. Um, what I did was even in chapter one of the book, we analyzed uh, all 158 sectors of the GICS uh, classifications. And what we could do using big data was to analyze every single EBITDA, earnings before tax and interest for every single one of those top 30,000 companies split it by sectors. Now, if you take out just the top four players, we can give you exactly the split of profits, exactly a, a pretty good, and, and also for sales and general administration, which is a branding or capital investment or R&D or international sales. And it does indeed work out that if you take the top four players, they've got roughly on average 40% of the whole lot. And the moment you, you have mapped your sector, if you say, well, they're above average or above 40%, say, they take 60%. It's less vital if it's below average. If you write down with a, uh, a lower concentration metric, you may only be 20%, but you've got to know where you are on the map. Now that is an incredible uh, appropriation uh, by the top global companies. So we can't understand wealth without understanding it. If we wanted to be a strategist or a government and we said, we don't care about that. Well, you're saying you don't care about half of wealth creation. Uh, it's, it is the story. But the second thing is, I've done an analysis later in the book, as you saw, showing the split by country, they almost all of that wealth is from uh, global oligopolies coming from four main countries, America, China, and so on. So we have to be now excited by those players, even when they're not in our own nation. And that does transform the way we think about state policy as well as our corporate policy it affects the distribution of wealth and it, it changes what we are going to need to do to create the wealth of nations looking forwards, whether we like it or not. And it's going to turn out that what we need more than anything is the foreign direct investment. Many of these companies actually deliver fantastic things. You look at the internet companies today, we wouldn't be here without Zoom. 
But there is an issue of how do we handle such economic wealth? And it is now a global problem that may call for international cooperation between governments. Yes, Jure, but I mean, if I go back to my Adam Smith, he must he would be absolutely horrified that this would be this is the direction of the, the business development of the world. Um, and I, in many ways, if you're battling for FDI all the time, isn't that like just basically the role of the state to go around and beg the, the headquarters to give us FDI or something? I mean, it's kind of a reductionist role for the state at this point. Well, um, actually, I don't really think Adam Smith wanted the state to get too heavily involved. Um, but for Adam Smith, the fact that, that business goes global, that markets go global, is actually positive. It's actually logical. I think he would be horrified by the extent of concentration, and that would be a shock. And he would, in fact, be saying, well, for heaven's sake, you, this is the point at which you bring in at least some regulation, antitrust regulation. You've got to think about, also today, we've got to think about tax, uh, climate change, and so on. So from an Adam Smith perspective, and from my perspective too, there does come a point where we now need a Biden-led administration that's more positive, first to be talking to Europe, they have a lot in common on some of these issues, especially with the big internet companies. And I think we also need to bring China into the fold as well. The problem is all our antitrust historically is done regionally, but these companies are not just national players anymore. They are global. So in order to regulate effectively, and the most you can do, you have got to bring the USA to talk to Europe. We've got to work together. And I think it's inadvisable to, to have China outside that fold. Sure, I, I get the military thing, but we've got to bring them in commercially and work together on a degree of antitrust for those top oligopoly companies, in some cases, watching for them playing us off against each other on tax avoidance and on climate change. We do need that response. But Adam Smith would say, don't over expect what you can do. But he would be horrified by going too far towards the Marxist type, almost total appropriation. But I think it's unrealistic to think the world is fragmented. It's no longer fragmented. So we want to work with those multinationals. Many of them have delivered fantastic things, uh, but there's a little bit we can do cooperating with other top uh, parts of the world. Yeah, because I, I, if I look, I looked at the, I, I always read religiously the Financial Times and the New York Times all the time. And I'm looking at the New York Times, it's big tech turns its lobbyists loose on Europe, alarming regulators. Obviously the EU is warning the big tech companies that they might be broken up. And even the US government has kind of come in against this. So, I mean, in many ways, your story of strategy is this kind of, very admirable story of kind of businesses figuring out how to manage global operations. And yet it strikes me at the level of society, it's, it's also creating this level of dangerous inequality, um, let alone, uh, as Leslie Martin also said too, kind of missing things on climate change and everything else. Yeah. And so these are kind of working completely at odds with one another. Well, I, I, I would just, I would defend the, the, the global oligopolists a little bit here, because actually, although it's been incredibly tough for legacy countries like Britain and especially Greece, where, you know, suddenly you're hitting global competition and you're seeing real suffering in terms of poverty. And that is really depressing and, and sad. But actually, from a global perspective, we've got to keep the perspective that more people have been taken out of poverty by this new wealth creation process in the last 10 years that we've ever seen in history. I mean, it is incredible, but of course, most of that alleviation of policy or reduction has come in Asia. And that has been a benefit to them. I mean, even in the last decade, the Chinese have tripled their average wages, tripled, while Greece at one point had halved. And the poor young guys couldn't even get jobs. That's a 
multiplication factor of six in just 10 years. So get these issues right, and it's very powerful. But it can be incredibly difficult for countries who are legacy countries, who are born with empires, when suddenly they have to fight for that wealth. And so I do, I, I, but I think that there is something positive potentially there. I don't think it has been totally negative uh, with some of the wealth coming in. Uh, some of it has, Microsoft has given more money to alleviate poverty in Africa, has saved more lives putting money into that. It can be positive. But I think we have to harness, at some point, we have to control these guys where they've got too much power. That is true. I agree with Adam Smith. But I think we need to keep a positive stance as well. We want that investment from those players. Okay. So, so let me, this is going to be my last kind of question. And then if you would, uh, the, the panelists, would you have any questions that I will ask or that we will open it maybe to the gallery view and have more questions here, but at least for the time being, if you have questions uh, for Chris, please put them on and then I will ask them. But this, so this will be the last one of that I will ask. And that is, We've been talking about global Britain since I've actually since I've arrived in Britain. We've been talking about global Britain. How well are British firms prepared to take on this uh, global competition and global consolidation, in your opinion? Well, there are a for any nation in the future, there are only going to be a tiny number of sectors that you really are going to sustain your global champions. If you had an, if you imagined a hundred countries in the world and a thousand products, and we went all the way to globalization, eventually you'd only end up with 10, 10 sectors instead of a thousand. And 99% of your wealth would come from sectors controlled by other countries, by those global multinationals. So don't expect too many sectors where Britain is really going to lead the world. We do have some great companies. AstraZeneca, I'd say GKN now with Melrose is a superb engineering company and we have British Aerospace and so on. But don't expect too many. The companies that are gonna succeed like that, generally speaking, will, in, their, if they're in international markets, they are learning and they have to learn to go global. Like they have no choice. They have to be very sophisticated. I would probably put more attention, though, on uh, what we have to do to keep and retain the best global companies. Because when a UK multinational looks at investment, when they look at the issue of Brexit, for example, they are not looking through different eyes to the Americans, the Japanese or the Chinese. We all are looking at how big is the market? Where is the market? Well, you know, three or four cities in Asia are equivalent to the whole population of the UK. The only difference is that they're growing a damn sight faster. So we are having to orientate to those global markets, but we in turn can gain. Those successful global players know they have to put the assets in around the world. And we can make a huge difference by attracting the best investment and make sure it comes. But to do that, we're going to have to see the world not through our jingoistic eyes. We're going to have to see the wor world through their eyes. And their eyes are pretty internationally orientated. And they're saying, well, actually, we, we didn't come for the British market, which is quite small and mature. We came mainly for Europe. So if you want our investment, help us actually have a really good business base. But actually, the deal we are doing, hopefully, in the next few weeks will be very important from their perspective. Uh, so that's going to be increasingly important to the wealth of our nation and our grandchildren. Okay. And so aside from the Brexit issue, what are the kind of key policies that you see are necessary to for to attract more FDI from other global companies around the world into Britain? What needs to be done, in your opinion, to keep it competitive in this kind of every country begging 
these oligopolies to come invest in your country? Well, I think firstly, your kind of basic attitude makes a lot of difference. I mean, the difference between China and Russia, where I've lectured in both countries a lot and seen their companies, the difference between them at the end of the communist era was that Russia has remained, sadly, still pretty hostile to any foreign direct investment. Not that many executives feel that comfortable in terms of personal safety, and it can feel a bit hostile working in Russia from an outside perspective. China, on the other hand, are tough negotiators, but by goodness, they have really, this year, their foreign direct investment going in has increased by two thirds. They have brought in the foreign direct investment and it can be really, really positive. It's helped them take off well. So I think we need that attitude, that we need a positive attitude, not a kind of fuck business attitude. It, it's got to be positive and it's got to be, you know, we, if we're going to be global Britain, we want to be genuinely looking like a Singapore, that Singapore provides access to the whole of Asia. It's open, but it's not jingoistic. It's giving you entry. And I think we need to be open Britain, but really making ourselves attractive, both by our disposition, our attitude, our government policies. But we also need to do the best we can to take into account what they need, and they need big markets. Okay. I have a question, yes. if that's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really interested in someone who's uh, obviously not from around here, um, and you've obviously joined Glasgow, and we're really pleased to have you in Scotland. And you mentioned reputation there. Um, we in Scotland um, are already really lucky in that when we're trading, we're able to charge a premium that's higher than the UK average. So someone told me the other day, I think the figure was 10% if the product was Great British, but 15% if it was from Scotland. So we're doing well in terms of people valuing quality products. And the trade on products, for instance, whiskey, we've managed to um, keep our volume the same, but increase our margin. So we've moved into that from mass market into specialisms, which seem to be doing quite well. Um, but that reputation bit for doing trade and, and attracting these co companies here is really important. And we've just ranked um, third in the OECD for um, attitude to um, global awareness, I think it's called. Um, so we're doing, we're doing all right. And I kind of, did that make a difference to you coming to Scotland? Um, well, I think that, you know, it, your questions are touched, slanted, Susan, in that I, you know, you happen to have picked a number of sectors like the spirit industry is one of Britain's most successful exporting industries. Diageo was the first company we were doing the PhD on that led to the concept of global winners uh, just before it formed. We are immensely strong on those sort of areas. And, you know, if we're talking about uh, the kind of branding opportunity in, in some areas and the hospitality attitude. And if we're talking the attitude to foreign direct investment, we speak English and so on. Um, you know, it, it, and it's also, it, you're right, it is a very tolerant, safe environment. Uh, I have to say coming up from England, it, you know, 20 years, one years ago, it, you know, Edinburgh particularly comes over as, you know, quite multicultural and, uh, tolerant and attractive. But I think that reputation tends to go with the sector a little bit, you know, um, you know, that we do have certain winning sectors, but we would struggle in other sectors, perhaps where other factors might be at work if we're not careful. Uh, you know, we did lose, we want to keep the electronics industry, but we did lose some areas of that. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, it, you know, we lost HP, for example. And, uh, you know, we do have some some great companies in Scotland, but most of those are pretty global orientated. I would say Diageo is, you know, all its assets are around the world, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not so easy for Diageo either. I mean, Trump put on this massive tariff against uh, against Diageo and the whole of our whiskey industry. So I'm rather hoping that one of the outcomes of a good Biden EU talk. I know Biden wants to go to America first, but actually that could be win-win. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we shouldn't be having these massive rows about 
Airbus and Boeing. I think we need to help each other. And the moment that's resolved, then the whiskey industry will lose that tariff. And it's a huge tariff. So I, I'm, I think Diageo deserves our support there and, and also all the whiskey industry. And the salmon industry, the food, food side too is amazing. The golf, you know, there's a lot of plus, plus areas that you can't win in everything. So if you've got some assets, that's attractive. So Lucy, are you able, Lucy's doing our tech behind the scenes for everyone on the call. Lucy, are you able to open it up? So um, Donald had a question about agriculture. Um, is it possible for him to- Yeah, I spotted that. Yes. Okay. Um, I think, you know, this, we have to differentiate agriculture into the different sectors, the different tiers, if you like. You know, we have, we have kind of food production in the world that there are some areas of that that are very global. If we take the things going into food, some of that business is. But if we take farmers themselves, I think their concerns are slightly different. You, you don't take a, a typical farm global. And so their biggest concern at the moment will be what is happening with Europe. Um, you know, they export a huge amount to Europe. Their biggest concern is that the government do a deal that will give them a good trade off. And similarly with fishing, you know, we, we, we need, uh, but I would say that most people, even in the agriculture, fishing the whole lot together, they don't want a deal to be stymied by just fishing quotas that affects a small number of boats by and large. I would say that, that a lot of the farming interests and a lot of food companies actually have a big interest in keeping the best possible access to the European market right now. They have less opportunity to transfer their assets abroad. You can't take your farm to some other country. So to help them, it's not quite the same global game. The global side of agriculture comes in in certain areas that are much more traded around the world. Uh, and we do see global concentration happening in some of those sectors. But, uh, but that's very different to being a farmer uh, per se. Okay. Um, Leslie, are you able to turn your microphone on and ask your question direct on climate change? Lucy, are you able to make that magic happen? Yeah, uh, Leslie should be able to talk now. Hello. Hi, Leslie. Hi there. Um, well, it was really just, yeah, just a question that I think it's already been alluded to that, you know, somewhere else in the world, global, globally, we're having all these discussions about climate change. And, you know, somebody said recently, climate change is not a problem to be solved. Climate change is just a condition of life which will create many, many problems to be solved. And it seems to me that any solution is going to come from these companies because of the power they wield. So I guess my question is really how their how business strategy of these companies might evolve to try and adapt to and help solve these these problems that are going to affect the whole of the, the planet really. Yeah. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think that they, but I think the exciting thing comes in when you get the different sort of government positions coming in. And, and it would help to have the accord across the world with climate change. But companies can adapt to that. I mean, if we take mark, if we take the market cap today of Tesla, it's just under 600 billion. It's 10 times the market cap of General Motors that not a few years ago was the biggest player in the whole car industry. Why? Because electric is going to be so much more value creating if we take the long-term future. So Tesla and the market will repivot towards electric. We can do that if we get a clear signal for governments. And even the signals we've had so far that are not perfect, you will find companies are adapting to that. Even Shell will be adapting pretty heavily to try to repivot. We know the damage that's going to happen to those companies if they do not. You saw a massive reduction in the share price of those oil companies uh, recently. Uh, it's coming back a little bit now, you see, but they, those companies 
are willing to adapt, in my opinion, but you do have to set sensible targets. Those targets have changed. My goodness, they've changed. Our automotive industry is utterly changed and we will adapt. But I do think government has to come in and give us the clear regulations. And it's another case where Global Britain actually needs to be talking. Really, we want Europe, America to have really good conversations. And believe you me, the Chinese are very, very driving on that too, because pollution is a far bigger problem in the big 10 cities in China than it is for us. And they don't have the legacy interests of General Motors. They, they can, to some extent, see a massive opportunity for their companies with the new, more environmentally friendly possibilities. If they can see that opportunity, I think you'll find Chinese companies will be, they'll be putting Tesla's battery companies going in and uh, companies, multinationals, global companies, we do have the resources to deliver and you need those resources. But I think they will repivot and they are repivoting, but the governments do need to set the steer. And it would be great if we could get Biden and the EU and China together more positively to really drum that home. I, I agree. Are there, are there anybody out there that I can ask? Uh, I can either ask the question from the chat or as someone want to jump in with another question. I'll just allow everyone who's um, asked a question in the Q and A to um, to talk if they'd like to. So just feel free to jump in once that permission is given. Okay. So I see David Hood. Do you want to say something? Yes, thank you. This is uh... yeah, you, uh, the microphone's too low. Let me see if I can get, get on the chat. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so here's oh, sorry, the there's a question for Jeff that I've answered. I'm sorry. I, I hope, no, uh, no. Jeff, you were supposed to be coming in on that one. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, it always, help, always helps when you find the turn up, but there we go. Yes. Yeah. Um, interesting conversation um yeah i was wondering about the the notion um as regards the uh, oligo oligo i can't even say the oligo please see, I, I, haven't, I haven't even had any christmas cheer yet it must be said but anyway um yeah, i'm wondering more about competitive advantage because that's that's a particular interest to me and how the smaller businesses and others and innovators and startups always try to emulate those large companies because they're so successful and and yet You'd think that, yes, uh, you know, as per the theme of, of tonight's um, presentation, they are important to economies, they're important to the global economy and to national economies. But is there, is there an inherent danger there that in, in emulating those successes, we're actually st stymieing innovation in itself because everybody wants to be a skyscanner, everybody wants to be an Amazon. And I, and I, and I think there's a da an inherent danger in, in this kind of just this rampant, rampant emulation of companies. And also that's supported by many studies, research books, et cetera, et cetera, in the chattering classes, as I put it, um, that, that they tend to look back in those successes and, and have some kind of formulaic way to, to innovate, way to, to grow, way to, to make your company the, the next large, big monopolistic firm. Um, is there a danger in, in that approach that we keep looking back at all these success, success factors for those large firms, and yet what, we, what, what, what do we do? We try to emulate them within the small and growing companies, which, which I find quite incredulous when you want to provide something that's a different offer or a different company or a different brand. Um, well, I, I don't think successful smaller companies like the niche players we've talked about from particularly from Germany in chapter seven, I don't think they are simply going head on on competition with the big companies. Typically they are niching. And I think one thing we need to emphasize is that the dynamic picture of competition amongst those global oligopolists that I've portrayed is actually highly Schumpeterian 
it is very dynamic. What's happening all the time is that we're constantly getting new players coming up. So Zara, for example, is doing brilliantly. And then today, Azos is taking off using the online and that's, that's moving up very fast indeed. So I think one thing we may have played down in the discussion is the incredible importance of some of these disruptor, more entrepreneurial uh, strategies. Although many of the big companies were very entrepreneurial, that's what got them going. I don't think it's a bad or thing if, the, if you are so successful as an entrepreneur that you really do take off and you scale up. Uh, if, if that becomes a large company, great. I think that's really good. But um, I think I'd be a little bit careful about me overgeneralizing for SMEs. It is a little bit different at the small level. I mean, I'm horrified by how many of our very small SMEs are even trading in Europe today. And I'm horrified at once you put up barriers, if they're struggling to trade with Europe now, how are they gonna go international when they are very small? How are they gonna have resources? So I think the SME problems are slightly different to the issues that I've concentrated on particularly here and to some extent in the book that I've dealt more with the big companies. Where I've dealt with the smaller companies have been typically the small niche players that probably have grown successfully in the international markets, so both in Britain and Germany. Um, and they don't exactly emulate the big oligopolist. They are very, very focused and usually deliberately move aside from the main head-to-head -head competition. And they've got something unique and they're very dynamic. And like, all of those things I, I see as positive, but perhaps the book is a little bit less strong on the SMEs uh, that even in analyzing 30,000 companies, I can analyze a million companies today on big data, but even there, we don't really get to the small companies. And uh, so uh, the really small SMEs, I, I would acknowledge have slightly distinctive problems, David. Thomas, Thomas, do you wanna jump in real quick? We don't have much time. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, for your very good uh, both book and talk. My question is this, um, from a UK perspective, competing internationally in manufacturing seems unrealistic, except in speciality products. Yeah. Does that force the UK to look even more to the services sector, where international cost competition seems less intense? Um, well, I think, I, I, just to say one thing that I was discussing with Jeff earlier was that it was totally horrifying for me as an engineer to lecture in Shenzhen back in 1996. And I expected to find huge amounts of manufacture. They used to be really good on manufacture, very cheap in Hong Kong, and it had all gone. And as I took the ferry to Shenzhen, I suddenly realized where it had gone to. It had gone to Shenzhen. Almost metaphorically on that ferry, the whole of manufacturing had gone. And I suddenly thought, my God, all my training was about helping manufacturing survive. But you could lose this enormous chunk of it almost overnight. So there has been a very important trend where you have to be incredibly good in terms of relative comparative advantage to survive in manufacturing. But we do have some players in manufacturing, but they have to be absolutely at the top of their game and you can't expect as many. So certainly the trend has been into other areas. Your area of kind of drinks, for example, that you've got great experience in, Thomas, and uh, the drinks industry has been well, where brands become more important and services too. And that will, that is bound to become increasingly important. I, I don't see that change reversing overnight. Uh, that's true. Uh, 40 years ago, America was governed in the news by what was happening to US steel. And then now, do you even hear of it? 
Susan's I, perspective may change. Do we have time for one more question or not? One, one more very quick question and a very quick answer, Chris. I don't want to take everyone okay. over the five o'clock too long. Vodio, right. do you want, you've been waiting patiently, sorry. Vodio, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor ah, Moore. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, my point is, yeah, it's a very broad question. Sorry for that. Uh, we have some like, we have faced global problems, pandemics, corruption, tax avoidance, terrorism. You covered a few of them uh, in our quick lecture. And, but uh, those problems should be addressed at a multi-country, multilateral level, not at a at a single country level. The difficult question is, how do you suggest large companies and large countries, developed economies, to get together to try to solve those problems? Um, uh, yes, I'm not quite sure if I fully understand the question here, Avodia. I mean, there is a problem. If we take Russia, for example, where, where I also lecture, um, clearly, you know, the difficulty there is that they're not really very interested in discussing issues of mafia, the corruption, things like that with, with other countries outside. The, the, I think politically that's almost unrealistic. Um, so we, if you go into Russia, you, you have to go in knowing that it's very different uh, operating there, I would say. Um, so I, I probably doesn't quite answer the question, but where you can work together is international bodies are getting together on, you know, if we say the SFA investigations, you know, the world has changed in terms of what is acceptable in terms of ethical practices internationally. And, and those top execs really can go to prison. So we take it very seriously indeed. And the fine levels are huge. You know, I talked to one of the top world banks uh, in Thailand and they're saying, well, if you think we're gonna go with local levels of corruption, forget it, because it would destroy our brand internationally. Um, so I, I, think, I think companies will respond if we can get greater cooperation across borders. I have to say that when you hit corruption in individual countries, some of those regimes are quite political and it becomes, you really have to know that part of the world and appreciate what it is to operate there. Uh, they can be very different. So unfortunately, Chris, I have to bring it to a close now. Um, we've just gone slightly over our time and I'm really um, conscious not to keep everyone longer than we um, pledged to them that we would. So um, I really want to thank everyone for joining us and thank Chris and Jeffrey for and, uh, absolutely fascinating discussion and so much food, food for thought. And I think what was really, really interesting for me was to hear such a global outlook at the turn of a year when we've very much been focused much more locally than we might have ever imagined at the start of the year. You know, I, I definitely feel I've been locked down in my community for, for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and also our supply chains have gone more local than we would have ever mm -hmm. imagined. So, so, so much food to thought. So I do think we'll be returning to that more global outlook as we move forward. Um, and I'm also, we're doing a lot of research at the moment for a project that will launch in February. And so much of that is um, about Scotland's reputation in the world and how that's critical to business and trade relations. And I think you brought out so much of that. So we're really pleased that that research is going on here in, Scot in, in Scotland. Um, so I'd just like to wish everyone um, a really happy Christmas and thank them for their time today. Um, and we hope we'll see you all in 2021 in a much healthier and a happier world. Um, I, we will make the recording live on the web, so please feel free to share it or go back over anything because there was so much food for thought there. Um, but just once again, if we were in person, we would be clapping. Um, it feels a bit funny to do that online, but a virtual clap to you, Chris, and a big thank you to you, Jeffrey, for sharing it. Thank you very much. It was really wonderful discussion. I wish right. you thank you, you, Susan, Jeff, and thank you so much to all you guys for coming and participating. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.